Dover Modern Poets. We're delighted you could wrestle yourself away from Christmas shopping tonight to join us. And um, later on in the evening, we have um, <clears throat> Alison Winch, Jill Abram, Charlie Dupre. Or is it Dupre, Charlie? Dupre. Dupre. Um, if you haven't been here before, just to tell you a little bit about the Poetry Cafe, you're probably twigged as a bar upstairs. Uh, you're welcome to bring drinks down, of course. Um, a toilet's at the back. Um, <clears throat> The management requests you don't take your drinks out during the interval because the neighbours are a bit fussy um, and they've had a few problems with their licence being threatened. Um, apart from that, enjoy yourself uh, and relax. Um, we're going to do a show in two halves, traditionally, um, be an interval of 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, I'm going to start. I'm Patrick Cunane, so welcome. Christmas, she will be forever dancing on the roof of the universe in this town of light, where the party goers go mad in the mad streets of the night. Christmas she will be forever, dancing in the blaze of departmental stores. In mad joy, tears blizzarding from blue eyes, falling dry ice in the Christmas snows. In the mad streets where the party goers go. And in the morning, fortunes lost will be counted as fortunes to regain and to lose yet again. In the new year where the old years are nowhere to be found and there is nothing to do but make mad mad love in the great grey dawn in this town of light. Is it a bit squeaky? Yeah, just I think you should bring the level down. Yeah. The volume or the level? Uh, either. Okay, let's try that. <coughs> is that better? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm the test poet. Um, <clears throat> I went to the Leonardo exhibition um, recently and uh, looking through the publicity material I discovered I was born 500 years of the year after Leonardo and I also share a birthday with, birthday with Michelangelo so I thought um, us three should be linked in some way. Um, so this is Mike and Leo and me. I was born 500 years after Leonardo share a birthday with Michelangelo. Leonardo didn't always finish his paintings, whereas I complete my poems, for better or worse. I've enjoyed the same Florentine views as Michelangelo, known many Davids. I haven't painted any chapel ceilings, but did a fair job on my bathroom. It's nice, the three of us having this thing going, connected by numbers, humanity, maleness, we all have that urge to create something, to strike a match in the darkness. If we met in the pub, we'd be firm friends before you could say Renaissance. Those two are probably wine drinkers, but we won't hold that against them, in all fairness. <laughs> Staying firmly rooted in the past, um, this is a poem that was written by Ovid um, about two and a half thousand years ago called Waiting for Corinna. And it's a, <clears throat> a nice sort of little love scene going on here where two lovers meet on a summer's afternoon, what you might call a tryst. And it's got a bit of form because in 1583 Christopher Marlowe decided to write a new version of it. Um, and later on, in 1968, a poet called Guy Lee wrote another, another version for the swinging 60s. So I thought it would be nice to bring it up to date for the 21st century. So this is waiting for Corinna. Waiting for you, Corinna, that summer afternoon, window half open, casting a lazy light, like the hour after sunset, dawn's first kiss, the half-light shy girls need to hide their fears. So you came, Corinna, fresh air in a short dress, waterfall of hair flecking the palest neck, lovely as all your lovers say. A princess stealing in. I lifted your dress. You wriggled fish-like. A slim brown trout torn between the river, your own desire. You paused, lovely beyond compare. Naked, glistening, nipples granting me permission. Breasts high above your brown stomach. Tiny waist, old enough thighs. Why say more? You stepped toward me. Later we slept, no regrets, where now such summers, 
where such sex About 31 years ago to this very day, <clears throat> or yesterday, depending on which time zone you live in, um, John Lennon died, and um, I went to Havana last summer and I found there's a John Lennon park in Havana, so we went there, and um, when you go into the park there's a lovely bronze statue of John just reclining on a bench life size, and as you approach the statue, the little park ranger steps out from behind the shrubbery and he's got John Lennon's specs, and he asks you if he wants, if you want him to put the specs on the statue so you can be photographed with John and his glasses. And the reason there's a ranger looking after them is because tourists have taken them as souvenirs in the past. But I did think only in Cuba could somebody get a full-time job being the keeper of John Lennon's glasses. So I thought it's worth celebrating. Out of the shade steps the keeper of John Lennon's glasses, slips them over the ex-Beatles bronze ears. I shove up next to the great man, put my arm around his shoulders, made too warm by the heat of the sun. You capture the moment. When I meet John Lennon's likeness in Havana, a life-size casting on a bench, one leg draped casually over the other. I attempt to swap specs, but the keeper wags his finger. I take a moment to bless John for his life in my life. I place a coin in the keeper's palm in recognition of the sacred task he has been anointed so to do. It's not every day you meet the keeper of John Lennon's glasses. <laughs> Let me take you down. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect timing. Okay, um, I was on a plane um, returning from Amsterdam to London and the girl sitting next to me who was Dutch offered me a biscuit. Um, so this is Biscuit Girl from Amsterdam. <laughs> Would you like a biscuit, said the girl sitting next to me on the plane from Amsterdam. Her teeth so white I think she must eat only apples. I appreciatively take one. Crunch away. They are like our English biscuit, the hobnob, I say. Her eyes widen. The hobnob? <laughs> Those white teeth again, as she digests this important information. We call them country cookies, she says at last. Isn't that funny, I think. Hobnob sounds much Dutcher than country cookies. <laughs> She is on her way to Nepal, where neither obnobs nor country cookies can be easily found. Instead, she will digest the thrill of exploring fresh lands, a world experience through young senses, opening like a giant lotus obnob in any flavour you like. Okay, this is my last one in the first half, and it's the title poem for my next collection, which will be out in a few weeks. It's called Looking for Eden. Let's take a last look at Eden, you said, your deep Glasgow burr causing the phone to rumble in my paw. I knew what you meant. The wild what have you of Campbelltown, the Isle of Arran, rainy wick, where drinkers stand at the bar and a dog munches on crisps. An eighty shilling and a grouse gleaming in the one bulb light. That's Eden, all right. Remember, you said, my fine poet of a posh Glasgow suburb with its golf club on a hill. Remember, you'll live long on a diet of curry, whiskey and cigarettes. It was sound advice in the sense of I like the sound of it rather than anything else. <laughs> OK. So, um, our next poet is, in fact, apart from me, I think it's fair to say all the poets on tonight are uh, new to Dodo Modern Poets. I'm delighted that they're here, um, keeping the uh, thing alive and fresh with new voices. And our next performer, Jill Abram, um, is a 
very active in the London poetry scene. She's the director of Malaika Kitchen, which is a poetry collective. Um, she's the winner of the Poetry Pulse competition and other slams, I think. Um, in, in March the 2nd, uh, Camden Poetry will be putting on a celebration by Malaika Kitchen Poetry, um, in which Jill will be also performing. So I'd like you to give a proper pre-Christmas Dodo Modern Poets welcome to Jill Abram. Here yeah. she is. I wish I was cool. 